All right. Let's get things going. So as she mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about security automation today. I'm going to talk to you about some of the new standards that we have in this area. I'm going to talk about some of the things that people are doing with the technology out there today. And I'm going to leave you with a few uh, words of wisdom, things to look out for based on experience and uh, where some of the pitfalls are so that you can avoid them. But first, let's start with the why, because I think that's always the most interesting question before you get to the what or the how. Why security automation? Why do we need to be worrying about security automation in today's world? Well, you know, how many people are familiar with the OODA loop? Could I see a show of hands? All right, pretty good in this audience. Not surprising. Uh, the OODA loop is something that was invented by a U.S. Air Force colonel. Oh, I seem to be going wild here. Uh, I'll let the guy at the AB desk. Uh, no. I seem to have some uh, problems with the slides auto advancing, so I'll let him uh, figure out what the issue is. Uh, I want to get back to this one. U.S. Air Force Colonel John Boyd. So John Boyd was a fighter pilot in Korea, and he observed some really interesting things. One of the things that he observed was that although the U.S. aircraft was perhaps technically outgunned by the opposing forces, uh, it was still able to succeed in most dogfights. And he was asking himself, you know, why is this smart guy? He started asking that question, why? And he realized that the reason that we were able to succeed is because we were able to outmaneuver the opposition. So we were able to complete this OODA loop that I referred to earlier faster than the opposition. What is that all about, that OODA loop? Well, it's about being able to observe, orient, decide, and act more quickly than your opponent. And if you can do those four things in battle, because in battle you are continuously cycling, looking around you at the incoming aircraft, deciding what are they trying to do? Are they trying to you know, get on your tail? How are they going to do it? Are they going to go over the top? Are they going to come up from underneath? What's going on? So that's the orientation, figuring out what's going on. Decide what action you're going to take, and then take that action. If you're able to complete that cycle more quickly than the opposing forces, you're going to win. And it doesn't matter if you're outgunned or you know, who's got the, the better munitions. <laughs> if you're able to get on their tail, you're going to win. And you know the same thing is true in cybersecurity. And let's take a look at how we're doing there. Unfortunately, the attackers are inside our OODA loops. And I have some stats to back this up. Basically, they're able to complete that loop much more quickly than we are. Let's take a look at this data, which comes from the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. More than 60% of data breach attacks that they investigated, the attacker was able to get into the organization, grab the data that they wanted, and get back out again in less than a day. And in almost half of those cases, they were able to get in and get out in less than an hour. That's pretty impressive. You know, this is like bank robbers. You know, they know that it's all about time, all about every second. You know, how quickly can they get in, get the money, and get out? Well, the same thing is true in cybersecurity. If they can get in and get out before you even know you've been hit, <laughs> you don't even stand a chance. How are the defenders doing? Well, <laughs> Most attacks weren't discovered for more than a month. So we've got a little time scale issue here. With the attackers able to get in and out in an hour or at the most a day, and the defenders, they're taking more than a month to figure out that they are even being attacked. Um, in fact, most of these attacks were not discovered by the institution that's being attacked, but by somebody else saying, you know, we discovered your confidential data out here. These credit card numbers trace back to you. So that's really unfortunate. You don't even know you're getting hit. It's a little lower for large organizations. So the attackers are inside our OODA loops. How are they doing it? How are they outmaneuvering us so radically, orders of magnitude? Well, the answer is they're using automation. That's not surprising. If they're going to get in and get out in less than an hour, they're not sitting there like, what should I do next? No, they've got a plan. In fact, they've got an automated attack toolkit 
probably something that they bought off the internet, off some chat room. And the sorts of things that it does, I mean, these are garden variety attacks, really. The ability to search for unpatched vulnerabilities, search for default passwords, guessable passwords, you know, this is, this is simple stuff. But what they're able to do is to broadcast out their attacks. And it, for example, using spam emails, sometimes targeted spam emails, sometimes broadcast spam emails. And then if they send out a million of these things, some percentage of them are going to hit. They immediately get notified that one of their attack toolkits has hit, what the target is, and they're able to take advantage of that and say, OK, I'm going to make use of that. Go for it. You know, Get me the information I need. So they do it using a variety of different techniques, in some cases spear phishing, in some cases just broader phishing or uh, malicious compromised websites. So this again, hard data based on uh, a, uh, uh, the Symantec Internet Security Threat Report. So in essence, we're being outmaneuvered by orders of magnitude. <laughs> if this is us over here in our aircraft, that's the attackers. Not only are they faster and more maneuverable, they also have better uh, uh, ordinance than we do. So what are our options? Well, the first thing you might say is, let's so th throw some people at the problem. Unfortunately, there aren't any more people to throw at the problem. <laughs> we, uh, you know, U.S. government projects a need for uh, 10,000 more information security experts. Um, there just aren't 10,000 more security information security experts. We're training them up as fast as we can. And within U.S. government, as fast as we train them, they go over to the private sector. <laughs> um, even in the private sector, we're facing problems hiring information security experts. And even if we had the people, we don't have the money. You know, it isn't like we can increase our information security budget by 10 times. That's just not practical. So we're not going to be able to brute force this problem. We're going to have to get smart about it. And my contention is that the best way to approach this problem is to automate the defenses. Since the attacks are already automated, there's really no way we're going to be able to improve 100 times our defensive speed using the same tools that we were using before. We need a new generation of tools, and that's what security automation is all about. So now we get to the what, <laughs> now that we've covered the why. What do I mean by security automation? Well, security automation is not a magic silver bullet. It's not a single product. You're just going to buy a security automation. Give me one of those. Put it on my network. It's going to solve my problems. Although there are probably some vendors here today who would be glad to sell you one. It's not. It's a set of technologies, a set of processes that are designed to hook together existing products to allow routine problems to be handled automatically and to allow products to work together to expedite your ability to respond to threats. Basically, we want to tighten this OODA cycle, this OODA loop, and we want to let your routine problems be solved in an automated manner so that your information security experts, the one you have already, can concentrate on the novel attacks, the really strange stuff that they haven't dealt with a hundred times before. So you can think of it as an OODA loop. You can think of it as plan, do, check, act. That's the terminology that ISO 27001 uses. Or you can think of it as prepare, detect, analyze, and respond. That's the terminology that I prefer. But it's essentially the same thing, a four-phase uh, cycle of information security automation. Now, what are these four phases? Let's drill down on each of them in a little more detail. Well, these are the things that we're already doing in information security. We're just doing them in a manual way. So when we talk about prepare, we're talking about analyzing your risks, coming up with some policies and controls that you're going to use to mitigate those risks, and training your staff and your employees in how to deal with them. When we talk about detection, there are a variety of different te detection technologies that are employed today, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But we're not talking about you need a new way to detect threats. You need to be able to feed all the detection information you get into a single location, into a single alerting system, where it can be correlated 
and analyzed in either automated or manual uh, modes. So we have some automated analysis techniques listed here. Human analysis cannot be left out of this component, though. There are always going to be problems where you're going to need to have a human get in there and figure out what the heck is going on. We haven't seen this problem before. But there are also plenty of ones where you can have an automated system do that analysis and correlation for you. And if you decide that it's a threat that you've seen before and that you have a response you know how to deploy to that threat, then you want that response to take place in an automated fashion. So that goes through all different phases of response, but at least you want the containment to happen in an automated fashion. When that machine is detected, which is infected, and it's going after your secrets, you want to put in place some sort of enforcement to keep it from getting access to those credit cards or that top secret information or that, you know, whatever it is they're going after. So you want to automate this as much as possible. Okay. Uh, right, so there's the opportunity to automate within any of these components, but more important is automating the complete cycle because that's where you improve your uh, response time. So now we've covered the why and the what. Let's talk about what are the benefits that you get by using security automation. And this is based on some of the examples that I have later in the talk. You get the ability to obtain better situational awareness, to have better understanding of what's going on on your network. Because instead of using what I like to call swivel chair integration, where you have different consoles from different vendors and your analysts have to be constantly swiveling among them trying to figure out what's really going on, you can have a single console with all the information in one location. You have the ability to share information with other folks. Because uh, there are some new standards that are coming out, things like Taxi and Sticks, that allow for automated um, machine-readable formats. Uh, for sharing information about threats that have been observed and then being able to import those threat descriptions into your security automation system. You don't, you're uh, better able to uh, share information with others and to make use of the information that you get. You can have a manual or automated response, as I discussed earlier. And by having a single security automation architecture based on open systems, you can plug in new components as needed. New sensors, uh, new analysis capabilities, new response capabilities. This is not about limiting what you can do. This is about expanding what you can do, creating an overarching architecture into which these components can be plugged. Because there's always new detection, new analysis, new response capabilities that are coming online. So what are the challenges of security automation? Well, for one thing, security automation is new technology. This is new stuff. And uh, so there are going to be some surprises. If you become too complacent, then these automated responses can be used against you. So, for example, the attacker might be able to figure out, oh, whenever I do this, this happens. So I'm going to make it look like there's an attack coming from this particular IP address. And then there will be an automated response against that attack. Well, that IP address might be your security administrator's IP address. You don't want that happening. Uh, and one way to deal with that particular issue is to have a kill switch for the security automation <laughs> so that you can turn it off when it's being used against you. Um, you don't want to become too complacent. Um, if the security automation is just working great, you know, and it's handling routine problems, that doesn't mean that it's time for the folks in your IT security department to go take a break, you know, go on vacation or whatever. This is their opportunity to work on the harder problems, to look for the attacks, the APT attacks that are sophisticated enough that they're going to go underneath the radar, underneath that automated detection system. And that's, you've got to have a human in the loop for those attacks. So let's move on to some examples. The first case study that I have here is related to bring your own device. But 
in a novel setting. The setting is a school district, the Naperville School District in Naperville, Illinois. Let me tell you a little bit about the place. Bucolic, I'm sure, but large. Uh, 18,000 students, 2,500 staff members, 25 locations, and experiencing rapid growth. Does this sound familiar to any of you? I mean, we all work in large organizations, or many of us do, uh, with rapid growth in the number of devices that are deployed. So they've got not just laptops, and certainly not, I'm sure that it's not the school district that has been buying twice as many computing devices in the last few years, but people are bringing their own, bringing their own tablets, bringing their own laptops, bringing their own computing devices and wanting to be able to use them in that educational setting, just like they do in our business setting. And the school wants to enable that, just the same way that we want to enable our executives, our engineers, our marketing folks to bring their own devices and make use of them in, their, in our own environments. They figure that technology in the classroom, well, that's just the way that things are done now. We need to give our teachers all the tools that they need to keep the students engaged and to prepare them for the future. And we need to let the students bring their own devices as well. So their goal was to be able to offer one-to-one -one computing for students. Nobody has the budget to buy all of that gear, so we want to allow students to bring their own devices to school, and we want to integrate those devices into the curriculum. Uh, it also gives the benefit, perhaps, of being able to redirect some of this uh, budget that had previously been used to buy the end-user devices for the students and to let the students have the latest devices because, you know, Lord knows that's what they have at home, the latest iPad that they got their mom to buy. It's not just the students, though. It's also the staff and the faculty. And to be able to provide seamless access to those devices with strong security, because you can't have them browsing the Internet unfiltered in a school and setting, and to be able to have operational efficiency, to use the automation, to, you, to uh, accomplish their goals efficiently, to avoid disruption, and to reduce costs. So in a school district, you have to make sure that the kids don't get into the grading system. That's definitely key. <laughs> so um, these goals, although they're described in terms of a school system, really can apply in any business setting as well, being able to provide uh, BYOD capabilities, seamless access, strong security, uh, and reduced costs. Those are all things that we want in the business setting as well. All right. So how did they do it? Well, step one, going to offer Wi-Fi, secure guest Wi-Fi uh, via wireless LAN, and then to provide more access to the teachers and the staff, use network access control. And even the students, if they want to access school resources, are going to need to go through that network access control as well. It's going to make sure their machine isn't infected, check it for patches, and enforce the extra security policies that you need to have in that school setting. Different levels of access for different roles within the organization and different levels of security on the device. So the teacher might be able to bring their personal device into the classroom setting and use it for teaching, but they might not be able to use it for grading. For that, they might have to use a school-issued device. All right, I see we've moved into the diagram here. The whole thing starts with policy. Now, they have a policy that says those bring your own devices, they're getting access only to a BYOD network. We're going to limit their access to the most sensitive resources like that grading system and we're going to monitor the behavior. So you bring your device, it gets connected up to the BYOD network because it's identified as a BYOD device. And then if that device starts doing something that it shouldn't, that'll be detected by a sensor within the network. And an alert can then be sent back through a component that's called a metadata access point and sent back to a policy decision point so the device is placed into a remediation network. All of this is made possible through open standards from Trusted Computing Group called the TNC standards, Trusted Network Connect. And at the TCG booth back there, we have some architect's guides that describe 
how to implement BYOD and a variety of other solutions, including security automation, using the TNC standards. And we have some great demos as well. So the results they were able to achieve in Naperville. Well, the teachers can teach from their own tablets. The students can use computer-based learning techniques with their own devices. They don't have to worry that the student's behavior at home might compromise that grading system um, and uh, other critical components within the, within the school network. Now we'll move on to one other example. So that was an example of security automation in action from the network security standpoint. How do you implement BYOD using security automation? Now let's look at a different one, endpoint compliance. And we'll look at US federal government. That's uh, quite a contrast to the Naperville schools. Much larger scale, but similar problems in a certain way. They realized that they needed to do a better job of configuration management. We all know that better configuration management helps to secure systems better. And uh, in the recent FISMA report, uh, they found that there was a significant need for improvement in that area. So the goals were to create common configuration baselines for widely used products, such as Windows, to be able to express those configuration baselines in a standard format, like XML, so that the baselines could be developed once um, and then uh, used across a wide variety of vendor tools. And then to allow for automation, security automation, with respect to collecting the results uh, of those uh, baseline checks. So an architecture was developed called SCAP, Security Content Automation Protocol. It includes a variety of different components, and I don't have time to go through all of them here today, although if you Google it, you can find out all about it. <laughs> um, these components are certainly not created by TCG, but we now have a standard way to integrate them with TCG. Uh, we have a, a document on integrating SCAP with the TNC architecture. So these components allow you to establish standard uh, configuration checklists and other uh, forms of compliance checks and to express them in a standard way. That's what SCAP is all about. And it's being used widely across U.S. government today. So U.S. government decided that in order to make SCAP successful, it wasn't enough to just create the standards. They also had to make sure that there was a testing program in place that would ensure that products actually work properly and implement the SCAP protocol properly. They put in place such a, pro a process and a testing program. They validated commercial products against it. There are now 50 products from 32 vendors that implement it. And they developed standard checklists expressed in the SCAP format. It's been quite a success. Uh, of course, they had to promote adoption by uh, requiring the federal agencies to actually report on their compliance uh, using these techniques. So how does SCAP fit with TNC and with security automation in general? Well, it's not enough just to have data formats, which is what SCAP gives you. You also need to have protocols. That's what TNC gives you. So this is the TNC architecture that we looked at before devices trying to connect to a network, and a policy decision point, which decides whether they get on or what level of access they get. SCAP layers on top of that. You have host-based software that gathers information about compliance. And then you have some server-side software that receives the results and decides what level of access that device should get. So that's how SCAP and TNC work together. And this is an example, a worked example, uh, from a real customer who's using the two of them together. Establish a policy for what's permitted on the network, and when a compliance system arrives on the network, it gets placed on the production network. Fantastic. Well, what happens if the policy changes? Perhaps some new patches are released uh, from Microsoft, and the organization decides that these are really critical for their environment. Well, the policy gets replaced with a new policy that now has those hotfixes added. 
and the device is determined to be non-compliant. Of course, it's immediately placed onto a remediation network. The patching operation takes place automatically, and then the device complies and is able to get access to the production network. So this is a great example, as with the previous BYOD example, a great example of routine things that you don't want your security administrators worrying about. <laughs> you want to make sure that all your machines are compliant, but the last thing you want is having some highly paid and very difficult to hire IT security administrator having to go out there and do the patches or worry about the patches. You want to be able to just configure the policy and have confidence that everything that's connected to your network is compliant with that policy. And even better, with SCAP, you don't even have to create the policy. If somebody else has created a policy that says this is a secure configuration and you've decided, okay, that's good, and they come out with a new version of that policy, you can just import it in. So the results, all these different kinds of scanners are able to use the same content. All these different parts of the U.S. government are able to use the same content. They might tweak it a bit. But they don't have to tweak it much. They don't have to create the checklists from scratch. They can use these SCAP results with TNC together and use them for network access control. So where are we going next with security automation? This is a great time to be working in security automation. There's so much happening. The Caesars FE architecture is a new architecture for security automation that's being developed by NIST. And uh, this diagram of spaghetti <laughs> illustrates the uh, current draft of the Caesars FE architecture. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through all the noodles today, but uh, you can Google it and, and read more about it. The gist of it is it's designed for an architecture um, which allows for uh, automated compliance checking um, and uh, multi-vendor interoperability. It can even work across multiple uh, organizations, and within a large organization, you can have multiple uh, uh, systems for uh, continuous monitoring of endpoint compliance. It works with TNC also. Um, TNC can play uh, a role there in collecting data from the devices um, and uh, adding a sensing capability. Now, uh, TNC and SCAP are working together, these two efforts, um, but there's also other efforts going on out there. The SCAP community itself is working on new projects like Enterprise OSIL, um, which is a checklist interactive language, so a, a scalable and efficient way to uh, answer the sorts of questions that uh, a human needs to be involved in answering. Uh, ISO, uh, the International Organization for Standardization, has developed a spec called SWIDS, or Software ID Tags, well, which is very popular. In fact, we have a demonstration back in the TCG booth there of SWIDS working with TNC. Um, it's a, a great way to systematically identify what software is installed on your machine. So it's working with TNC as well. Uh, the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, has three work groups in this area, the network endpoint assessment, management incident, uh, or managed incident lightweight enforcement, I'm sure I, I used to remember what Miles stood for, and the security automation and continuous monitoring work group that's just started up there. So uh, also TCG, uh, leaving the best for last, has uh, both the trusted network connect effort that I've described already, and uh, TPM, of course, which you've heard a lot about, um, both of which can be used in a security automation environment, both from a networking standpoint and from a strong authentication and strong uh, device compliance checking uh, capability. That's what TPM can, can give you. And I'm glad to say that all these efforts, all of these groups are working together. So we're not uh, going our own direction, but making sure that all of these components fit together and that we're not reinventing the wheel. And I encourage you, if you wish, to become involved with them um, or talk with me afterwards and give me your feedback. 
Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to leave you with a couple of key recommendations. First of all, I definitely recommend that you automate your defenses. After all, the attacks are automated, and you don't want to be a sitting duck in that generation-old uh, uh, fighter plane. You want to be up to date and able to respond uh, at a similar rate um, as the attackers. Now, you are going to need to have humans in the loop sometimes. Routine tasks you can automate. Less routine tasks, you might want to present the user with a recommended action and let them confirm that they want to take that action. And for the really tricky things, uh, you're going to have to have human analysts involved in combing over the data to find the attacks. But uh, automate the routine things. Use open standards. Uh, that allows you to uh, be able to adopt new technologies quickly and integrate them with the ones that you have. And it helps with the interoperability, especially in the BYOD environment, where there are new types of devices coming on your network all the time, and you have to be able to figure out how to deal with those devices. And make sure that your automation infrastructure itself is secured, because otherwise it can be used against you. And here's my contact information. At this point, I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have. Questions? Here's one in the front row. So, so, so for people that don't work with TNC and the standards every day, there seems to be some, some confusion as to, sometimes it appears fractured. Yeah. Right, because you do have the different standards. You've got the SWID stuff. Point to you, um, <laughs> Mr. Swid. No, yeah. I don't think so. Um, you've got sticks and taxi. It appears that there is some conflict sometimes between even some of the groups when you when you start to think a little deeper. Yeah. What's the best way to, to look at from an enterprise perspective at applying those standards appropriately? Because I'm sure they all have their right use cases. They right? do. I mean, how how do you how do you really start to engineer that solution? It goes back to one of the questions asked this morning in the keynotes, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we begin to do that, right, from an enterprise perspective? Great question. So we're trying to provide some guidance in that respect, and that is, I say we, I mean the Trusted Computing Group. These architects' guidance that we've released to try to provide guidance about how to use the standards together to solve typical problems. And I think you're right that this is an area where we have not done a perfect job in the past of explaining how the standards fit together. Not even close to a perfect job. We would just sort of lob the specifications over the wall and say, there you go, you know, a 500-page document describing some fantastic ne technology, and you figure out how to use it in your enterprise environment to solve your BYOD problem. You know, I mean, it, it becomes sort of an um, exercise left for the reader, you know, homework project. But that's really not appropriate and not helpful. Um, so that's why we've created these architect guides. Now, the architect's guides, they're six pages long. So they start with what's the problem, and they run through what are the appropriate technologies and how should they be used together, at least our point of view on it. They're not going to take you all the way down into the details of how to use them. And that's why we started, especially when it comes to these technologies like SCAP and SWIDs, which are not TCG technologies but which have a role to play within the TCG architecture. That's why we started to publish these documents on how to use them together. And they, these documents, such as the uh, SWID messages for IFM um, and SCAP messages for IFM, um, those go into the greater level of detail. They tell you exactly you know, what role SWIDs should play within a TNC architecture, what role SCAP should play within a TNC architecture and how you use them together. And then finally, I recognize I'm probably answering your question in more detail than you had no, no, intended. Right. Um, there's something that we call profiles. So we have already a clientless endpoint profile for TNC, but there's a new profile that just came out for public comment, uh, which is the, uh, the endpoint compliance profile. And the endpoint compliance profile really fits it all together at that finer level of detail. It says if the problem that you have is the same one that we described up here for the US government, 
you know, the problem of how to manage compliance for our two million machines, <laughs> and how to gather all of that data, and then how to mine that data in order to be able to say, well, what percentage of my machines are subject to a new vulnerability that's just been discovered, new zero day, for example. Which of the TCG specs should you use? And in what combination should you use them? Um, that's what the endpoint compliance profile is all about and goes into much greater detail than an architect's guide can because it's not subject to those six page limits. With the architect's guide, we wanted to have something that would be appropriate for everyone from the IT director on down, maybe even the CIO or, or higher. We wanted to have something that, was a, that we could explain things in terms that a business person could understand and then get a little bit deeper into the how so they see what components go together. But the endpoint compliance profile spells it all out in, in, in great detail. So I hope that those pieces that we're providing, that guidance that we're providing on how to fit the specs together will go a long way to addressing your concern. But I completely understand that this is just a start on a problem, that there's a need for similar things with respect to TPM applications and SED applications. And I would love to have that conversation with you if you, um, if you think that that's uh, valuable. I think it would, from a, TNC, a TCG perspective, we are very interested in how we can integrate, provide guidance on how to integrate our, our specifications together how to solve customer problems with them. Um, after all, a, a spec is not useful at all unless it's actually implemented. Thank you. You're welcome. And another question. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Steve. Great presentation. Um, I quickly want to go back to the example related to the US government. Yep. Um, my question is kind of. Uh, which of the future, which of the constructs from the future efforts yep. are used in the U.S. government example? Okay. So let me. Or perhaps another way I'm asking the question is how much of those are based on existing products or the, as well as future work that was yep. used. So when we talk about what's currently being done in U.S. government. Of course, it's a large organization and there's a diversity of answers to it. But I think it's safe to say that across all the different agencies, SCAP is in wide usage, um, both for U.S. GCB and, you know, it's customized to different agencies and departments' needs. So SCAP certainly has broad usage. TNC, it varies from one agency or department to another. Some of them are using it, some of them are not using it. Um, and when we get into the area of integrating TNC with SCAP, as illustrated in this diagram, um, that's something that's uh, fairly novel. Um, and uh, there, I'm aware of one department that's using that, um, but it's you know it's, it's, it's a, a new a new frontier, I guess I would say. The integration of TNC and SCAP is not something that's widely. Uh, used in deployments today. Each one separately, yes, but together, that's rare. Did that help to answer it? Yes. Good. Any other questions? I think we have time for at least one more. You can ask a hard one if you want. I'm looking at Chris, but uh, Tool raised his hand. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. That's okay. Yeah. So I, I just want to pick up on what Neil was saying, and uh, maybe it's a it's a thinking out loud. Maybe it's a question, but we've got standards bodies that build standards and create specifications, and we've got implementers that build products, and we've got customers that use it. But the the real question that is still unanswered in the ecosystem today essentially what, Chris, uh, what Neil raised is how do all of these things fit together and where is that little, one little diagram I can look at that says here's how this fits and this fits and this fits and here's, here's the end result and here's how we solve something. And I think that that's a very difficult question to answer because 
it's going to depend on who's actually implemented it and whoever has implemented it and what problems they're trying to solve and who's built it and what's their business model. And so my question, I guess, is if a standards body can produce some sort of a guidance around these architects' guides and so on, is it, who should be taking the lead on a larger picture? In this presentation, for example, we talked about how the attackers are doing a great job, and there was a very um, a good high-level overview of, of all the things that the attackers are doing. But there isn't a corresponding high-level overview of all the different things that can be uh, brought to bear at, 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 a, at a production environment to thwart those attacks. There's, there's standards, there's this, there's that. Who should be taking that responsibility on if it isn't? And I really don't like the, you know, the, it's, it's all of our job, everybody's job, but somebody has to, I, I don't know what the answer is. Yes. Well, I'm afraid that ultimately uh, the buck stops uh, with the CSO or the CISO within a corporate environment. That's generally the person who's ultimately held responsible for figuring out what are the particular circumstances of that organization, what are the most critical risks that need to be dealt with, and how should they best be dealt with. So it all ends up on their desk. <laughs> then the question is, how can we help that person? We as a standards group, we as uh, as vendors or system integrators, how can we help that person make good calls as to how to spend their very limited budget? And instead of spending it on trying to increase the number of security experts 10 times, perhaps use it more intelligently. You make a good point, though, that different customers are going to have different requirements. Each customer has their own requirement, their own threat model, their own you know, vulnerabilities of which they're aware, legacy systems, you know, they might have industrial control systems for all you know, if they're manufacturing, or a public utility, they have their own particular environment, regulatory environment. So I would never say that there's a one-size-fits-all answer to any of these problems, but that doesn't mean that every customer needs to start from scratch. They should at least be able to say, okay, here are the components that make up good practice for security automation. Pick up the architect's guide on security automation. See what are those components that I should be thinking about, or BYOD. You know, what are best practices? What are good practices? What are other people doing in this area? And then how can I apply that to my organization? It's going to be a little different. Maybe I don't need some of the pieces that they called for. Maybe I need some more. But uh, I, I hope that we're providing the tools that those CISOs need in order to make those decisions. And if the CISO doesn't have the in-house expertise, they may go to a system integrator. A system integrator or a VAR can have a very important role to play in building an appropriate solution for an individual customer. That is absolutely going to continue to be the case. And if I left the impression that the standards group was going to be able to give you just a, you know, a document that you were going to be able to follow and implement without considering your own organization's needs. I certainly didn't intend to do that, but we can at least give you some, some guidance to make sense of this uh, acronym soup <laughs> that Neil pointed out, um, where people, well, hey, how do I use all these things together? What are they supposed to do? You got to at least give me a clue. So we're trying to give you a few clues. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for coming out today.